Straight from the Mayor's Mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Hello everyone and welcome to Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Hello Matt, how are you? I survived. I'll be talking here about the uh, reunion. The year 10 reunion well from last done. Saturday night. Well done, how was it? It was fantastic. Started a bit after 5, 5.30, but what morning got there a bit early. It? Yeah, a just about. <laughs> <laughs> and we stayed there. I finally left at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right, that's, that's a big session for you. It is a big session. Yeah. And there were still a couple of stragglers left then. And so it was basically a fantastic catch-up. About, I think, 43 we ended up counting nice. from year 10, St. John's College year 10. But... I, I didn't drink any alcohol during the night. I thought there's too much to happen, too many exciting yep. conversations to happen. But the next day, yeah. I couldn't talk. My voice was oh, really? absolutely gone. I didn't realise I was saying too a fair much. bit, may I say, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was fantastic, and there were some people there yeah. who hadn't been back in Dubbo since they left. They might have left, say, at the end of year twelve. Right. They might have left to go away to boarding school, or there was one actually one of my good friends had left and gone down to to Tasmania, yeah. and so he hadn't been back to Dubbo since year ten. Essentially, left at the end of year ten. But they actually were overwhelmed with how the city had grown and how much better it was. And even a few of them said, I just went for a bit of a walk down the main street Saturday afternoon before the reunion. Yeah. Wow, there's lots of shops there and it's busy. And Isn't that so, wonderful? Yeah, yeah so yeah. It, was a, it was a really good night and lots of good old funny stories, ones yeah. That I'd either forgotten or someone had made up. So. Well, it's like the old line of what goes on the bus stays on the bus, isn't it? You can't right. be sharing those sort of stories. I can't tell you anything that happened on the <laughs> yeah, night. Can't tell right. any story that happened on the night. I'm sorry, but it was very exciting. And well done to the to the three ladies, mm. three good locals: Helen Jones, Sharon Hunter, and Jennifer O'Connor. And people have taken different turns of that. So we did one for our ten year reunion. Right. I was talking to one of the, the people on that night. And just talked about that. We estimated there was three of us: it was Graham Campbell, Michael Harvey, and myself that did yep. that year ten reunion. Sorry, that ten year te- year ten reunion back in nineteen ninety three. Hmm. And at that time, you can imagine trying to chase down addresses. So we estimated we spent six hundred hours on planning wow. that. Is that right? We sent out letters months before the reunion. Yep. Sent letters to the addresses we had. We saw before sort of the email correspondence the thing. was a natural So thing how did you contact yeah. someone? You didn't yeah. have mobiles, you didn't have email, you didn't have Facebook. Yes. You had an address their mum and dad lived at. So we sat down and went, right, now, Billy, he lived at 57 somewhere street. Okay, let's send a letter to there. Hopefully his parents are still there. So we sent yeah. all these letters and yeah. we got a few returns back and then a few letters that came back that said, oh, our son's now living here, our daughter's over there. So then we'd send the second. So we sent, I think, about three rounds of letters out to contact those people. And we I ended can up, see why you've added up to 600 hours. Oh, it was. Know? It was a process. Yeah. But even just sending the letters, I mean, we had a database that I set up and we mail merged and all that sort of thing. Mm. But all of that, and we did, we ended up getting over 60, I can't remember exactly how many, but I, I knew that we got more than half our form to come along, which we thought was pretty exciting and a bunch of teachers as well. Yeah. And not to take anything away from the three girls, that, or three ladies now, that did mm. the work for this one, but it certainly was a bit easier when we had a group, a messenger group, which we communicate yeah. on still regularly from people from school. But, hey, reunion on this date. Oh, good. Oh, who's not, not on this group? Oh, Jimmy's not on this group. I'll let him know. Yeah. So there's still a lot of work you do, and, and well done to those three, and thankfully someone did it, but it's certainly a different oh, scenario. Well, 40 years down the track, just tracking down people that haven't been in Dubbo for 40-odd years, just sort of trying to find out where they lay, you know, living these days must be such a hell of a job. Well, one of them came back from America, so wow. she lives in America now. Just came back for the reunion. For the reunion. I'm sure she Isn't came home fantastic? to visit some family and friends. Yeah, but, yeah. But absolutely, it was her primary purpose of coming home. We had another one from Perth, uh, all the way from WA, one I mentioned from Tasmania, mm. across the state. And some people even, like myself, had to travel like three or four minutes to get there. So. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the big travelling up, I'd imagine, up to, was it South of Tavern Tavern you had it at or where was it at? No, we had it at the Western Star Hotel. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, it yeah. looked like a great night. Saw some photos on there. May I say that some have aged better than others. It's the nature <laughs> of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> but it well, did look did like have, a fantastic night. I did have one comment on one of the photos where someone said, wow, that guy down the front there, he has an age real well. It was one of our teachers. So <laughs> he was in his Pete 70s. Pete Nathery or something, was it? Well, yeah. it, was, it was a guy, it was Graham Mully beside that, but, right, yeah, but yeah. they were mistaking someone that might have been 56 for someone that was in the mid-70s. Yeah, right. so, so <laughs> Maybe that could be what I'm looking at as well. That's well, it, yeah. that's right. If, if that's how they'd aged from school, then it would have been a, a tough upbringing. <laughs> oh, mate. Well, I'm glad to see you survived it and you got yes. back in one piece as well. So, my voice uh, is back. Yeah, voice is back as well. Good to see because we've got a bit to get through today. So look, mate, first up, I can't ignore the big news this week. 
$3.6 million from Squadron Energy with a public-private partnership to improve uh, Dubbo's uh, sewage treatment facilities. How good's that? Does, does this mean, of course, though, that we're going to be soon drinking our waste products? <laughs> oh, it's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to go? Uh, well, no, that's not our plan. Oh, okay. This is – and I actually said it on the day of the announcement. I believe, in my opinion – that this is the most exciting announcement involving a res since the 28th of July 2020, mm. which is when the res was actually announced. Mm. So before the 20th of July 2020, there was no, the res didn't exist. So they yeah. made the announcement on that date. And so then all sorts of things started falling into place. Well, you've always happening. been talking about the fact, what are we going to get back out of this? And here's yeah. a classic example, isn't it? Here's a perfect example. So mm. the way this worked was interesting. And PPPs, if I go PPP, tell you what a, a public-private partnership involves. Oh, okay, yep. I'll use an old Ian Chappell, the former Australian yes. Test cricket captain. I'll use one of his famous quotes and he said when you win the toss in a game of cricket when you win the toss nine times out of ten you bat first the tenth time out of ten you think about batting second and then you bat first (laughs) and that was a little bit of the the story with PPPs Mm. nine times out of ten you say we're not going to do a PPP the tenth time you think about it and then say no because a PPP potentially can expose a council, can expose an individual organisation to accusations of a non-transparent process or not enough probity and a whole range of things. And the Office of Local Government is not overly keen on PPPs, but there are some examples where PPPs just make sense. Mm. But in my whole time on council, go back to 2004, from 2004 till now, I've never seen a PPP used on this council. Yeah, they have right. been used around okay. the state. Yep. And, and what it is, is a PPP basically says, you're a private organisation, we're council, you're going to spend some of your money, your private organisation money, on building some type of facility, typically, some mm. type of infrastructure facility, but we'll run or own or manage that facility. And so the first question, of course, you have is, well, if you're going to do that, wouldn't you put that out to tender? Mm. Why wouldn't you go through a tender process? And it's typically when you've got such a specific situation that no one would be interested in a tender process or you wouldn't get as good an outcome. So let me talk through this one a little bit. Mm. We have in our strategic documents, and if you've got a good council, you've got lots of strategic documents, we've got a document or a strategic document that's got one of our points to say we should work on getting our treated effluent to a higher standard to use in different parts of Dubbo. And the reason you do that is that we use in our water treatment facility maybe 10 gigs on average. So it's sometimes more dry year, obviously wet year, you don't treat as much water. But let's Mm. say just for round numbers, 10 gigs. At our sewage sewage treatment facility, we treat up to say four gigs for round numbers. It's three to four gigs, but let's say four gigs. So there's four gigs of treated effluent. Now, what do we do with that treated effluent? Well, many years ago, before I got on council, they bought a farm, and it's called Green Grove. Right. And they take that treated effluent, and they send it to Green Grove, and we use it to grow crops. That was better than putting it back into the river. Is that what they would call grey water? No, no, this is definitely not grey water. Right, this okay. is at a much lower standard than grey water. Right, okay. So grey water is water that would be in your house. When you turn on the shower and... You're pretty clean when you get in the shower. You might have just been running at park run, so you've got seven drops of sweat on you, mm. and you get in the shower and you so wash. That's right, actually, these days. Too, by the way. <laughs> and, and coming down through the drain out of your shower mm. is water that's pretty well clean. It's not that dirty. So that's where you can, there are ways you can actually use that grey water for then, for example, using it on your garden. Right, okay. But when you get to the stage where you flush your toilet. That's a different That's situation. not grey water. Okay. That's a bit dirtier than grey water. Is that a difference between sewage and sewage? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> let me tell you about that. Right, okay. Off topic here a yeah, slight, yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. let me, I'll come back to where I was up to a squadron in a yeah. moment. But sewage and sewage, that's always one that gets people. And so I'll give you a little sentence. Yes. Because <laughs> I, I like this idea that what is the difference there? So if you break this down, and I'll explain in a minute, but the sentence that I love is that the Dubbo sewerage system transports sewage through sewerage pipes, treating sewage at the sewage treatment plant, which is all part of our sewerage oh infrastructure. God. That sounds like something an English teacher would probably try to get kids to spell or something else. You know? That's right. That's, so what so that? just for the record, yes. sewage, spelled S-E-W-A-G-E, that's the waste material that's carried away. So when we right. go to the toilet, we flush something, what we see in the toilet, that's sewage. Sewerage, 
S-E-W-E-R-A-G-E. That's the infrastructure and the system for collecting right. all the sewage. Ah, so that's actually, so sewage is the system. Correct. Sewage is what sort of is taken from In the from system. Well, in, in the, the system. system. In the system. Right. Okay, right. And okay. here's the tricky part. Then you think, well, if sewage is the infrastructure, then we must have a sewage treatment plant because the sewage treatment plant is part of the infrastructure. But yeah. no, it's a sewage treatment plant because you're treating sewage. You're right. not treating sewage. So, so there's a, these, these are two different plants then we're talking about. Is that right? No, no, no. It's, it's, one it's still the same plant. It's, it's, a, it's a sewage. We have a sewage treatment plant. So right. back on topic now okay. after that quick All English right. lesson. Yep, yep. Thank That's, you. Thank you very much. Well done. <laughs> the sewage treatment plant we have, S-E-W-A-G-E, yeah. treats our sewage. Yeah. That's part of our sewage infrastructure. Right. Now, yes. okay. coming out the end of that is about four gigs of treated effluent. So- wastewater that's been through the system, but it's still got microbes in there. It's still mm. got bacteria. It's still got maybe uh, some sort of treated poo in so there. So this is the sewage that's being treated. That's the sewage yes. that's being treated. Yes. Yeah. So what we do with that is we typically send that to Green Grow, to our farm, and we grow typically mm. loosened crops, I think, is the main thing we grow there. Mm. Now, do we really want to own a farm? Council probably owns things we don't need to own. That was a better solution, as I said, rather than pumping the treated effluent into the river. Mm. And so that's a convenient solution. But is there something else better we could do with it? Well, taking that treated effluent, four gigs, that's a lot. If we could use that somewhere in Dubbo, where we're currently using... fields, sporting fields? That's exactly right. If we could use it somewhere that's somewhere where we currently use potable water, so water that comes out of a water treatment plant, that gives us more potable water for the rest of the Because right now we're not using sewage water on or treated sewage water on our... Uh, ovals, are we? Typically, no, right. because some of that sits over an aquifer. So if we were to go and put that water over, say, go down the riverbank, put some of that treated effluent water over there, then, well, we wouldn't get permission for a start, yeah. but if we did, then that water would seep down and get into our aquifer. That's part of our bore network, and we'd mm. be pumping water out of our aquifer into our water treatment mm. plant, so mm. effectively we'd be taking that water, you may as well take so that like treated effluent. So contaminated effort. water then be sort of filtering down into our... Uh, Lovely bore water. Correct, okay. that's right, which then yeah, we yeah. pump into our water treatment plant. Yeah, right, okay. So at this point in time, no. Now, so we've got a strategic plan. Let's see how we can get that treated effluent to a higher standard so we could use it to water some of our fields. So some just of our getting green back spaces. now to what Squadron Energy is going to look at doing. That's exactly right. Okay. Right, so okay. we've got a strategic plan. Squadron Energy, in discussions we're having with the various proponents, various renewable proponents, we have lots of discussions about lots of different things. They want to know where they can do things, how they can do things, how council can help or how they can help council. And Squadron Energy said, we've got two big projects, two big wind farm projects, Ungla Farm or Ungla Wind Farm and Spices Creek Wind Mm. Farm. We need a lot of water. They need, over the construction period, and let's say maximum of five years, Mm. they'll need up to 400 megalitres of water. Now, that's an estimation by me. I'm not involved in the project planning for Squadron Energy, but it's a fair bit of water. Mm. Now, you can go to the market. You can go and buy temporary licenses, and you'll pay X dollars, whatever the market is at the time. So there would be a cost and expense to go and buy that water that they need on the open market. But we said, well, if you really want to leave a lasting legacy for Dubbo, then we can work out a way that you can get that access, access to that water and make a contribution to Dubbo. Mm. We said there's water that comes out of our wastewater treatment, our sewage treatment plant, that's at a certain level, but not good enough for your construction, not good enough for on our fields. If you pay for the construction of an advanced wastewater treatment facility, something that treats it to a higher level, then that'll be fine for you to use in construction, Mm. but also good enough for us to use on our fields. Mm. And we'll let you pay for that. Out of the generosity of our heart, <laughs> we'll let you... $3.6 million to be exact. That's, That's right. It. We'll yeah. let you pay for that facility and we'll let you have the water that you need for your construction projects mm. over that those two different projects. And then after that, we've got water to use in our fields. So I can see this is a win-win. Absolutely right. Yeah. The, the bottom line is that they would have had to pay for water that they would use in their construction projects. Yeah. But they wouldn't have had to pay $3.6 million. Mm. Again, it's a market that varies. They might have had to pay half a million, maybe a million dollars, depending on what the market was doing, depending on how much other water was around at the time. Obviously, in a dry year, water prices go up. But there's there's no way mm. they would have had to pay $3.6 million. But in terms of them leaving a legacy, and this is one of their real focus points, is to make sure they do leave lasting legacy, mm. then they said, well, we can see how that would work. Now, when I get back to the PPP part, yeah. if we got out a tender and said, we want to 
have someone build a treatment facility that they will pay for and you'll get, let's say, an approximation five years at 400 gigs a year, two gigs, and you'll get two gigs of water out of this process, then there's no one out there that would put Doesn't in a tender for that. not very attractive to me if I'm one of those sort of tenders, does no. it? No, and the other part is that I don't know any other proponents in this area mm. that will have the same volume requirements of water mm. as Squadron Energy. So the fact that they needed a lot of water, then there's tick one. Yeah. The fact that we can guarantee them this water, because we know even in a dry year, even if the rain stops, mm. then people are still flushing their toilet, they're still having a shower, we're still going to end up with water at our sewage treatment plant, or not water, we're going to end up with, with fluids and other things yes. coming through. So in a nutshell then, so the, the aim of the game then would be the fact that, that they're going to build this facility down there at our sewage plant uh, that's going to treat the sewage to a level that we can then use on potentially on our sporting fields correct? and also for them to use for their, their two main wind farm projects. Is that correct? correct. That's right. And okay. the water they need is for things like mixing of concrete, yep. so you need water for that, but you also need dust suppression, and that's actually much more, a much higher quantity than I ever realised. So the dust suppression during these projects for the controls I've got to have in place, they actually need a fair bit of water just yeah. for that. Okay, yeah, yeah right. So, and it, Is there a time frame in regards to construction on this? Yeah, or? it's going to be pretty quick. Okay. They'll be getting water out of that by before June next year. So oh, wow. By around about May next year, yeah. we'll see that. Now, let me just go back to a few other details on there. The amount that this advanced wastewater treatment facility will treat, that will produce each year, is about 700 megalitres. So remember, we've got roughly four gigalitres coming out of this, mm, mm. about 700 megalitres. Now, they'll need approximately 400 megalitres. Okay. So even from day one, we'll have a little bit of water, somewhere in the vicinity of 300 megalitres. But then when they're finished, say, five years' time, then we'll have 700 megalitres of water. Right. Now we'll run, So we'll still own and run the facility. And this is where this PPP comes in. So they won't even be building it they'll be giving us the money to build it. Mm. And I gave the comparison the other day. If we'd gone out looking for government grants, which is part of our strategy in the past, we want to treat our effluent to a higher standard, we'll go and look for government grants when they mm. become available. If the state or the federal government had made an announcement and said, you just got $3.6 million to build this facility, we'd all be saying, fantastic, this mm. is wonderful. Well, we've effectively got that from Squadron, with yep. the only difference being they want approximately two gigs of that water over a five-year time frame. So not a a large price in yeah. inverted commas to pay. Yep. And if another proponent came along and said, hold on, you did that deal with Squadron Energy, I want to do the same deal, mm. then we'd say, certainly, yeah. we've got the ability to go more than 700 megs because yeah. we've got more that's coming out of the sewage treatment plant. Yeah. Or you can buy some of that water, the excess water. Mm. I've already had one message from someone who said, we've got a business that uses bore water. Could we get some of that water off you, and then the bore water, you can have some of our bore water to use in your water treatment facility, which is obviously at the, at the right standard. Now, yep. it's too early to talk about any of that, and we'll work out how exactly we'll use the excess water, but something like that, we would go out to a public process with that mm. because there are mm. multiple people who would be interested in some sort of deal like that. But bottom line is, let's say we jump, past forward five years after it's up and running, so squadron to finish with it. We've got 700 megs of water then yeah. that would be at a high enough standard to use in our sporting fields. And that means then that potable water coming out of a water treatment plant that used to be used on fields, we don't need it for the fields. So now that's essentially 700 megs of extra water that we'll have from our water treatment facility. And keep in mind yep. that it's cheaper to treat the water out of the advanced wastewater treatment facility because you're not treating it to the same standard as our drinking water. So you're not using all the same yes, chemi chemicals, absolutely. not going through the same processes. But it's going to be safe enough to use on the ground. Exactly right. And that's yeah. where we've got to get the standards right. Yeah. We'll be working with the state government. The state government will not give us permission to use that water on the fields unless it's going to be at a right standard. So mm. we'll get all that in place in the design phase of the plant itself. And same with construction. If you've got Squadron driving around on their sites around farms, mm. spraying water for dust suppression, mm. you can't be spraying water that's no. treated effluent Absolutely. without going to yeah, a higher yeah. standard because yeah. all those farms around the area might be impacted then yeah, in some way, sure. shape or form. So oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a wonderful thing. I do love the fact that, as I say, it's a win-win for all. I think it is. I think it's one of those rare mm. ones where Squadron are getting what they need yes. and they're paying a little bit more for it, well, probably a lot more for it than they need to. I don't want to say it too loud because they might pull out some moment, but, <laughs> but they're getting what they need. Mm. We're getting what we need, we need. And the critical factor in all of this mm. was to get permission from the Office of Local Government. So we had to send a whole range of details through to the Office of Local Government and then basically say, here's what we propose and 
we had to wait, and that's probably been the main thing. We were waiting for a couple of months for them to come back and give us permission because if they said no, mm. then that's it. So the deal seemed like a good deal, but we would have had to try and approach it the other way. Was that way. because of a private operator coming in to do something that's a council-based facility? That's it. The whole PPP, public-private yep. partnership. Yep. And that's where the Office of Local Government doesn't love the idea of signing off on these every day. They really mm. want to have a good look at them. But we got the letter back, and I'll quote from a part of that letter, just to, to give you an idea. It's a, it's a long letter, but in that letter, it talks about the fact that the low risk. So essentially, they said... The Office of the Local Government has assessed Council's proposed PPP project as not significant and not high risk as defined by OLG's guidelines on the procedures and processes to be followed by the local government. So essentially they're saying we're comfortable with it, yep. so continue on. They can't give it approval yet because they haven't seen the final mm. process, but essentially there are guidelines there, mm. then keep following those. And obviously it doesn't mean that you can't follow the guidelines. It goes on further to say that... Council must still adhere to the requirements as outlined in the guidelines and relevant legislation. So that makes sense. They're not going to give you a a letter that says, hey, go for it now. Feel free to make up your own rules on this one. Yeah, Yeah. so you still got to follow the guidelines, but essentially it's got past the first hurdle from OLG to say, yes, we think this is We'll continue on, I suppose, is the mm. bottom line with that. Mm. They they can't give you the, the gold star and say, continue on willingly, follow the guidelines, yeah. keep doing it, and everything will be okay. Well, it's an exciting time. Well done to all involved. It's wonderful. Absolutely right. I think it is exciting. Now, I notice uh, the fact we might stick on uh, renewables for a little bit and Squadron Energy. I notice that you're in Wellington uh, at the opening of their new office there. Is this looks like quite a nice office set up, set up there as well. It's what, about 10 people employed in or something as well? Did I read that right? Is that what uh, the situation is? Yeah, spot on. And it's in a good spot. It's on the highway right. as you go down through Wellington, the old police station, which is now a museum. All right, okay. Opposite yeah. there, yep. which is not far from the new police station, but opposite there is the office. Yep. And people sometimes say to me, what are we getting? What's our community getting mm. from all these renewables here? We do talk about community benefit funds, about voluntary planning agreements, and they're a bit further down the track as things start. So we're getting a little bit of money out of Bedanga, for example, but mm. other projects will start. Mm. And you're getting a little bit of work now where people are seeing some different employees in the areas and they might stay at a motel or they might call in and get a coffee or a meal at the pub. Mm. But what are we seeing in real terms? And this is a great example of real terms. You've got an office there, yep. some landlord in Wellington now, someone renting that particular office. You've got 10 employees yep. and they're being paid money. They're buying their coffees. They're going to the supermarkets. They're part of the community, if you like. So you've got real money being mm. spent in mm. that particular area. But are they locally people that are employed or are they externally sort of coming in? Like what's, what's the situation with the employees? Well, that's a, a, an interesting question. I've been involved in discussions around projects like renewables mm. or mines with various councils and people sort of sit there and bang their fist on the table and say, we must employ locals for this project. Mm. The problem is, at the moment, in Dubbo Regional Council, you've got an unemployment rate about 1% lower than the national average. Is that right? Okay. When I talk to businesses, when I talk to employers, they're saying, we need more employees. We need mm. more. How can you get more employees to come to Dubbo? I can't get enough employees to run my business. So, for example, if we said to a company, which we couldn't necessarily do in terms of our power anyway, you must employ locals on this project. That office must have 10 locals mm. in that office. Wishful. Well, Wishful thinking, the problem is where are you going to get them from? Yeah, You're yeah, going to steal right. them from other employers because we don't have a high unemployment bringing rate. bringing in external people to town, that's, that's, that's how towns grow. Well, well. I actually it's part of the growth process. That's right. I jokingly at some of these meetings, I sometimes bang my fist on the table and say, we must employ out-of-town people. And everyone goes, what? No, we want locals. I say, hold on. If we employ out-of-town people, we're bringing people to town, and then they're locals. Absolutely. So once they're living here, they're locals. So you mean to tell me, like, yeah, you can imagine sort of people arguing against that, saying, oh, yeah, we've got to employ locals. Well, have you ever moved from one town to other town for a job? Yeah. Exactly Absolutely, right. yeah. And then you're a local. Then you're a local. You move, Absolutely. You're local. You, you take the opportunities where they present themselves. Now, that was a long way of me saying, I've got no idea mm-hmm. how many of those 10 are locals yeah. and how many from out of town. I know one of them. I know Justin Toomey White, well known for, ho- for his incredible rugby league skills, yeah. but I know he's employed by them and I met him at a function a, a month or so ago where he, he said he just started working for Squadron. So mm-hmm. he was certainly one of the 10 there, but I didn't actually get time to go and talk to all the 10 employees and find out their backgrounds mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. But to me... Whether they're locals or whether they've met a town, they're all mm. part of the Wellington community now. They're all locals in my mind. But remember, 
This is one project. Yeah. This is one proponent with one project at this stage. Well, squadrons seem to be really sort of setting a foot and, and establish their, a bit of an identity in both Wellington and Dubbo right now. Are there other groups as well that look as though they might be doing something similar to that, like setting up offices in Wellington? Well, they're probably a little bit more advanced in terms of where their project's up to. They've mm. started work on the road, the 12-mile road, which will lead to the Ungula project. So they've started work there. So there are other proponents. And one of the things that was spoken about at the opening – Jason Willoughby was there. He used to be the CEO of Squadron. He's now the chairman of Squadron. Mm. And he spoke about the fact that myself and Richard Ivey and council in general had said, you really need to leave some lasting impacts. And one of the things that was spoken about at one of those previous meetings was, why don't you have an office locally? Mm. And they've got an office in Dubbo. They've got about two employees in an office in Dubbo. And okay. at one stage, they were thinking, we'll just expand the Dubbo office. But hearing from myself, hearing from Richard Ivey, our deputy mayor, hearing from council in general, Jason said at the opening... Mm. Well, we thought the feedback was you really want to make a difference in Wellington. Mm. So we'll put the office in Wellington. We'll have more of our staff in Wellington because, let's face it, it's right near yep. where the projects are rather than in Dubbo. And I'm okay with that. Absolutely. Ten employees yeah, yeah. in the main street of Wellington is a, a really positive thing. Ten employees in Dubbo is still good, but it has much greater impact well, in said, Wellington. Like, yeah, these people go off and do their lunches. They want to go and shop there. They want to go and sort of just to communicate with other people around the place. It's a it's a win for, yeah. uh, for people of Wellington. It's That's fantastic. Right. So in relation to other projects, we'll mm. keep having those same conversations with other projects. How can you make a difference? How can you impact the local community in a positive way? Mm. And who knows what result we'll get out of those, but we'll, we'll be having the same conversations. But I think what Squadron are doing is showing good leadership mm. that other proponents Absolutely, may, yeah. they don't have to, but they may follow. Especially to say it's still early stages in so many ways with all of this. Yeah. So to have a group like Squadron in there sort of setting the example for others, it's pretty easy then to turn around and say, well, if you want to see how we should be doing, have a look at Squadron. Yeah. It's a classic example. As a, as a small little bit of uh, trivia for you, the office that they rented was an office that Richard Ivey used to be in as his office, his, his oh, own business, yeah, yeah. about 20 years ago, yeah. and I'd actually done the network cabling in that office. So <laughs> Richard, yeah, Richard yeah, reminded is. me of that. We went to the server room and saw the network cabling yeah, yeah. installed probably well more than 20 years uh, ago. Actually. Reminisced down old memory lanes. There it is. That's right. Ah, now, I saw that during the week we talked about this last week as well, that you hosted another Mayoral Developers Forum. So, very quickly, what's the history, first of all, of these forums? It goes way back, 8th of December 2011 right. was the very first mayoral developers forum. I'd become mayor of Dubbo City Council in those days, three months earlier, exactly three months earlier actually, right. 8th of September 2011 I became mayor. And one of the things, so I, I did a lot of interviews with different people when I first became mayor, got different stakeholders in, had little groups come, focus groups, that type of thing, to try mm. and get a bit of feedback and see where we should be going, what direction we should be taking. And one of the things that I heard from the development community was, oh, it's so slow to get things through council. Can you make it faster? And it's so clumsy and it doesn't seem to work mm. that well. And I went, oh, okay, let's have a look at that. And when I spoke to our planners, they went, oh, developers, they're not putting in applications that are fully configured or they don't apply with our DCP. We need our developers to put in better applications. I think, well, there's two separate points of view here. Let's put them in the room together. Mm. So that first one was really designed to improve relationships with developers, with other parts of the development community, whether it be real estate agents or architects or financiers or other people involved and our development staff. And so we started way back then. We ran those through W City Council days. Mm. Then through the amalgamation, obviously nothing happened then. After the amalgamation, I don't think things started. So when I came back in as mayor, I said, well, we've got to get these running again. One of the things that I find is great about them is we get to tell the development community where things are up to. And we have presentations from not just council and council staff, but mm. from other organisations. So, for example, the Real Estate Institute Arana, or Real Estate Institute Division, sorry, Arana Division, gave a presentation just to give people in the room an update on what sort of housing people were after, what sort of pricing that housing was at, what we need more of and less of. And so it was mm. more of the smaller. People are living in smaller houses with fewer bedrooms now. They're having families mm. that are smaller. So more of that and less of the three, four-bedroom style homes okay, and right. more on smaller blocks. So just that bit of feedback. So developers in the room go, okay, that's good to yeah, know. Yeah. If I'm developing the right path, they might have done their research anyway, but it's good to hear that in that environment. The New Dubbo Bridge, which I'm not sure how long we call it the New Dubbo yeah, Bridge. Yeah, that's right. Before we call it the… The old Dubbo Bridge. That's right. Almost new or yeah, a little bit older yeah, Dubbo yeah. Bridge. That There was a presentation from one of the staff involved with that particular project. That's not a council project. Mm. That's a state government project. But just to let people know about that and show where that's happening and just show the linkage there through to the new northwest area and then some different presentations from our staff. 
and then a Q and A. Q and A is always very important in that mm. whole process. Just to sit back and hear from the community, hear what sort of things are happening. Did you get good numbers? Were there like a, a lot of people turn up? I would have estimated, say, 50 were in the room. Yeah, that's a good solid number, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And From what, all different walks of development life? Correct. Again, absolutely. I, I know there were people there involved in the planning side, so planners, mm. architects, that type of, of industry. I certainly know there were financiers there. I know there were real estate agents there. There were people who built houses, so yeah, builders there. Yeah. There were people who do development, so the actual land development side. So it mm. covered all those. So your Q&A, you, you got some interesting questions to sort of to, uh, to sort through? Well, it was actually good. The Q&A in some times was bounced around the room. So in other words, a question asked of another person or another developer mm. in the room, sometimes of our staff, just explain some of the things. The Advanced Infrastructure Fund, we got $9 million. This is an announcement we got some time ago. Mm. $9 million to help build our Northwest Precinct, our main trunk road there. That'll be a $12 million build, mm. but $9 million there. And again, that was good because someone said, well, is that good for council's bottom line? Do you, is that basically $9 million that you add to the bottom line? And we explained, no, when council gets that kind of money, mm. what we do then is we'll reduce the developer contributions needed in that area to make the land a little bit cheaper. So when the state government in that case gave us $9 million, well, great, that means we can produce more cost-effective housing there mm. than us just taking a, a big chunk of profit. Yeah. So there were a whole range of different things brought through there, discussed there. One of the things I found most pleasing, and obviously you spend time afterwards talking to people, but there was a, two developers that I know that have come to Dubbo previously. I've met with them, I've spoken to them, I've even taken both of them around town to show them some of the different uh, opportunities, I suppose, mm. around Dubbo. Mm. And both of them grabbed me afterwards and said, we thought with our research, Dubbo was a happening place to be. We're looking at some developments we're doing and we're confident that there'll be good developments in Dubbo. But wow, sitting back, just seeing the presentations there, then hearing what's happening in the room, hearing from other developers mm. in the room, wow. This, so there's a real energy in the space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Absolute energy. And we're only just scratching the surface at the moment. So someone in the audience was Mike Sutherland who – Alcane, people would know him for, mm. but also ASM, the project, the, the Rare Earth Minerals Project yep. on at Toongai called the Dubbo Project. Yep. Not a very creative name there. But it's like the new bridge. <laughs> like the new bridge, that's right. Some, a bit more thinking needs to be put in some of these projects. I think I mean. so. Shark Bay. I see some yeah. sharks that's in right. the bay. What should we call Bay. this? Yeah, yeah. Little <laughs> the, Island. Or, or Sydney Harbour Bridge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done, it? guys. Smart work. <laughs> Is that the bet you can come up with? <laughs> so in the Dubbo Project, Mike gave a bit of an update mm. with the Dubbo Project. And so, again, people in the room go, wow, that's exciting. But then he also talked about the steps they're going through down around Bedangra where there's some gold deposits, which they knew about already, but they're exploring whether or not there's enough gold there. It mm. had been mined 100 years ago or maybe more than that, and then it got to the point where the mining process at the time, it wasn't cost-effective to extract anymore, so that was left. So mm. now they're looking at – they're doing some core holes. They've been doing those for some time just to – find out whether or not it's worth exploring that. And so far, every stop-go step they've had has been a go. Mm. Whether that will go through to completion, not sure. But again, it's another project. So there's yep. all these different things happening. And people just say, well, all of these projects, all of these things happening need people. I was going to say, that that's the big thing, isn't it? Here's, here's the common X factor. Yeah. All these projects needs more people. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's the, the challenge mm. and also the risk for us as a council. We need more people. Mm. Great. Where are we going to get them from? Well, they're out there. Where are we going to accommodate them? Well, that's a bit of the problem, which is mm. why it's never been more important. In the 13 years, almost since I hosted that first forum, I don't think it's ever been a more important time for the development industry to actually be aware of what's coming to mm. make sure they can start to cater to all of that. Are there any sort of common concerns that were sort of running, uh, being raised by the developers in regards to some of the problems they're facing? Well, every developer wanted developer contributions to be cheaper. Okay. So I get that. <laughs> I think we're all in that sort of vote, aren't we? We all want things to be That's cheaper. Right. And, yes. and yes, we'd love to make developer contributions cheaper, but what we've got to do as a council is make sure that various business areas of council are paying for themselves. So in developing infrastructure needed for an area, mm. we're going to make sure the developments happening in that area pay for that. So we want to make sure it's covering those costs. We don't want the rate payers of Dubbo that already exist to be paying for that new development. So, yes, we'd like to get them cheaper, but we've got to build things to a certain standard and have things at a certain standard. So those are the, the price as such. There was one – so medium density is an issue. We yep. need more medium density. And the market will deliver what the market wants. Mm. And so I think we will see some more it's, medium so density. So when you're saying more medium density, are they actually asking council here to uh, to look at the, the – 
at how they, uh, I suppose, the developer goes about the process of, of applying to to set out his, his structure, his blocks of his land. Is do they want them to sort of be able to make blocks smaller to allow medium density to happen, or what's what's the plan there? Well, one person wanted council to go and develop more of our land for medium density, but right. we did point out the fact that we're not the only developer in Dubbo, and it would be unfair if we said, great, we're going to make all our land ready for that medium density and the other developers forget about it. There's mm. a need across Dubbo, and there are some other developers going through that process with medium density at the moment, and you'll see a few of those, but one particular developer did express a bit of frustration at some of the state government heritage laws. They were having a bit of a uh, pushback and trying to get some things through with medium density mm. that caused a few delays with that one. Again, the state government still needs to be involved with some mm. of these processes, so that's a, a bit of frustration. Mm. And the planning portal, we've talked about the planning portal before, so there's a bit of a discussion around the planning portal, how much extra time that takes to have a more efficient, more transparent process. Well, mm. it's not mm. actually delivering on what it should be delivering on at the moment, but hopefully yeah. it will. That'll make things better. And even our staff time tied up with the planning portal, which, again, we've spoken about before. Mm. So there was... There was a lot of that. And then I think just general, there were questions about different things, about how things were progressing, where things were up to, just a whole range of questions where yeah. you could see it was a very engaged and active community. That's where those two developers from out of Dubbo mm. said afterwards that was absolutely fantastic. And we think that we were going ahead with Dubbo in terms of some of their developments. But now yeah. we're going to go ahead quicker and go ahead with more of that. So from here, is, is there another developers uh, forum planned or what's the, the GO from there? I normally have them about every six months. So I think okay. that's a reasonable time frame to give enough of an update that it makes sense yeah. and not too many updates that you say, well, we've heard all this before, there's not yeah. enough to do in terms of updates. There would be an argument that as things really start to ramp up, especially with our res, mm. you might want to run them every four months, so three times a year rather than twice a year. I did actually jokingly mention that on the night and some of our staff started to shudder because a bit of preparation work they've got to do mm. for these forums. So mm. I think at this stage, twice a year was a reasonable time frame to run them. Yeah. And that also keeps things bubbling away in terms of the information out there in the community. Because mm. again, a lot of it is knowing what's available. We're yeah. in council, yeah. our planners are in council. We're across many of these things that are happening. But for developers out there, as much as they might do their research, they're not always across every single thing that's happening and don't see every opportunity mm. that's out there. Oh, so it's been a great idea and look forward to six months' time to hear the next one. Now, there's another councillor workshop this week, Matt. Uh, what were some of the topics that were discussed uh, during this workshop? Two main topics of discussion. Mm. We've got our draft budget has been on display. We've got right. commentary back well, from that. Well, it's getting towards the end of the financial year, isn't it? So it very, is. very quickly. And we must have done a fantastic job with it because we only received 22 submissions. Is that normal? Do you normally get more than that? Or? Normally get more than that. Okay. Last year, I think from memory, it was 57. Okay. Maybe the year before, 85. So certainly okay. 22 is a lower number. So and mainly people just sort of saying, this is how you should be spending your money. That's in this uh, next financial year? Is that exactly sort of the right. The submissions are typically, hold on, you've got the draft budget out there, but I don't see anything there for this. Yeah, Can right. you deliver something along those lines? Yeah. And so the workshop was really to look at those, consider those. Mm. I do say to people all the time, put a submission in, mm. councillors read them. Not mm. only do we read them, we have workshops about yeah, them. Yeah. So we sit there and we discuss and the various submissions. And you're not mind readers. Like, like you, you can't no. sort of sit back and uh, sort of make decisions on what you think is happening out there. You've got to people sort of actually say to you, hey, listen, this is an idea or you've missed this or whatever. Yeah. I did find one thing slightly interesting, the fact that there were zero submissions in our budget mm. related to the Dubbo regional livestock markets. So oh. the sale yards. Is that right? Yeah. So we've had lots of commentary around say. the sale yards, but zero submissions as part of our draft that budget. That would have been something that may have raised a bit of attention. Sort you of think so? That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So again, it was just a, a funny little anomaly in there. I thought there yeah. would have been something like that, but there are a whole range of things discussed okay. in there. So I won't talk about them in detail. They'll come out in our business papers so people can see those submissions and mm. basically hear what they're talking about. But the other part of the workshop we had was a meeting with Belgravia. Now, Belgravia have got the contract to run our three aquatic leisure centres, our yes. three swimming pools. Yes. We had some issues during the swimming season that we didn't think were fantastic as a, an organisation, as mm -hmm. council. Yep. We've and spoken I've at length about that, haven't we? Yeah, yeah that's right. And I've certainly yeah. previously met with the state manager just to make sure that they understood on behalf of the community and the elected body, some of the frustrations we had. And that was during the season. Mm. But we thought it would be worthwhile to have Bill Gravy come along and meet with all councillors and just go through some of those various issues. And I won't go into explicit detail about some of the problems, but again, it was all about here's what's happened in the past. And I know my focus and certainly the commentary I had on the night was, okay, we've heard about the issues. You've given us some of the explanations about some of those. What I really care about is 
this season and next mm. season and the season mm. after going forward because you can dwell forever on the past yep. and you can jump up and down about something that happened five years ago. Address the problem, sort the problem out, and let's move forward. Yeah and, yeah, and I suppose the only two things I'd say is that when the contract was finally signed, it was 13 days before the pool season opened. Mm. So that was a bit of a challenge for them. And then they had three staff that came over because they're casual staff. You work through the summer – you're probably not going to say, I'll hang around all winter and wait and get that job at the swimming pool again next season. Mm. You're probably going to move on and do some other jobs. And then the next season comes around, you might have moved on and they need to find new people. Mm. So they had to employ a lot of people. And I think they employed somewhere in the vicinity of 67 yeah, right, okay. from August through to December. They so also, that's a pretty large staff, isn't it, for the pool? Is well, right? casuals. And, yeah. and you again, you've got people that will Turn come and start staff. work and then okay. they might be, right, I'm now going off to university or mm. I'm doing something else. So there's that process. But... One of the things I find, found fascinating, and it's somewhat ironic, there was some negative commentary around the pool that was being generated by probably a small number of people about that negative commentary. And, and don't get me wrong, there were certainly issues, there, well, were, there certainly were mistakes that, made. That, that had right. to be addressed. Some of those problems were because we had a lack of continuity of staff, so we would have had the same problem anyway. Mm. They could actually address some of the problems because they said they'd spent a lot of money on bringing people in from their other facilities because they've got facilities across... Australia and New Zealand, mm. so they could actually bring people in. If it was council that still ran it, it's hard to get staff now. So we would have had trouble still getting enough staff. So there would have been some times where we just said, there's not enough people to run this pool, mm. whereas at least they could bring them in. Now, that was at their cost, so they obviously don't want to do that. It's not in their best interest to do that. Mm. But in terms of that whole process, because there was negativity, they said that a lot of their recruitment they found more difficult because – there was negative commentary on social media. Mm. So what's fascinating about that is that mm. some people who would get on social media and say, oh, I had this experience at the pool. It was terrible. What a terrible place. This is all disastrous. What a disaster. Dubbo City, Dubbo Regional Council is because they've leased this out. Mm. And in saying all of that, then the people solution went, to the – People want to be part of that. That's yeah, right. Okay. And the solution to most of the problems, not all, but most of the problems, the solution was – more people, mm. more people that were employed there that could have some continuity that lived here, not being brought in from other areas. More people employed from here, working at the pools. That was a solution. Mm. But as I say, the irony is by people jumping up and down on social media mm. saying what a terrible place it was, it didn't that made it, made it harder to yeah. solve the problem. Now, I would say, I'm going to go out on a limb here, mm. I would say that some of those people that were jumping up and down on social media didn't really care about a solution. They cared more about trying to make Double Regional Council look bad. Mm. And unfortunately, that's the, the modus operandi of some people where they'll do that without thinking about the consequence mm. to the community. The consequence to the community in this case was that we didn't have the pools run as well as we would have liked to have them run. And yeah. part of that was the staffing issue. It's and interesting what, feedback though, isn't it? It is. Like, it, this is fascinating. And it's one of those sort of things I think too, Matt, that you know, we've talked at length in regards to the impact of social media across the board. And and how uh, you know, that negative, constant negative barrage, the, the damage it does. We talked the other day about Alice Springs and those type of things. Mm. You know, it, continual negative feedback coming through, constantly through social media and other sort of sources, it does horrendous damage. Yeah, that's Horrendous right. damage. And it depends what you're trying to do. If your agenda is to make someone something look bad, yeah. go for it. That's a really good job you're doing there. If your focus really, truly is to make the community a better place to live, then you'd be looking for the positives or constructive. Or yeah. I get people sometimes who send me an email and they say, we've got this issue, can you get it sorted out? I didn't go near social media because I know that won't sort anything out. Yeah. That will just create more of a problem or almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy that yeah. other people will, will pile on then. Mm. So the way to get it sorted out was to send you an email. Great, thanks. I'll go and get it sorted out and mm. away we go. Or... Now, I can't get that one sorted out for whatever reason, but at least you've got the answer there mm. without 20 other people having their commentary without, Absolutely. without knowledge. So, so getting back to Belgrade, do you think they're, they're well positioned or better positioned this time around to sort of start the, the, the summer season when it kicks off at swimming? Well, the proof will be in the pudding, which is yes. kind of what we ended up with at the workshop on Thursday night. Do you feel more confident, though, that they're, they're better placed, though, now? Well, yes, for two reasons. One, they have a program where their leadership team, not all their casuals, lifeguards, that type of thing, but their leadership team, they don't employ them as casuals for the summertime. They mm. employ them as permanent employees all year round. And then in the winter months, they'll find other work for them to do. It might be at other facilities. It might be doing some WHS planning. It'll be obviously taking their four weeks annual leave because mm. they'll say during summer, we really need you here the whole time. Mm. Take your four weeks annual leave when the pool is closed. They might even during the year, 
work some time in loose. So they might work some extra time, and then that's part of their holidays in their off season. So all of those things mean that they've got the core basis of their management team ready to go, and they'll also have more than thirteen days to recruit. And so that'll be an important part of it. Absolutely. And one comment which feeds into the negative social media commentary yeah. that was interesting is that the, the, the we had two people there. We had the state manager and a regional manager, and the state manager said we don't use organisations like Seek anymore. Recruitment is typically done via social media. So that even that amplifies, right? yeah, that even amplifies more Absolutely. the social media commentary because I would have thought you'd still post various yeah, yeah. jobs on Seek, but they yeah. said she said the the youth of society and the people they're looking for are typically kids finish school or yep. maybe home for a gap year, whatever. Yep. So they're fairly young. They said they look for jobs on social media rather than looking for jobs on well, Seek. there you go. I learned something new today. Seek's a bit old-fashioned, apparently, That's Mark. for the old yes. people like you and me, mate, That's is right. It? If I was looking for a job, <laughs> I'd go to Seek, and that shows how yes. old and out of uh, touch We are outdated. Look, I'm really hoping then that uh, with the upcoming season, and it'll be here before we know it in regards to the swimming pool and kicking it off, I hope that this is a, a much better start for them this time around and that those problems that we did have have now been resolved and we can move forward from here. And more than that, one of the things that I certainly said was that part of the plan, hopefully, for having an organisation like Belgravia take over the contract is they've got incredible experience mm. around all of their facilities across the two nations that they work in. Mm. I said, I don't really want to see you doing what you used to do before and making it a bit cheaper, which is you know, we're certainly we're saving money for the community. I want to see how you can make this place flourish, how yeah, this yeah, place can be yeah. better than don't it was. Don't just survive, thrive. Exactly right. Yeah. So. And, and she took that on board and said, yeah, that's obviously something that they should and can do, but they've got to make sure they get a baseline going first. Fantastic. Now, you always like to be uh, thought-provoking with your weekly Merrill columns, mate, and I notice that uh, you're a fan of the 1980s shows called Hypotheticals. I remember that, Hypotheticals, hosted by Jeffrey Robertson, I think. Mm. Now, you've posed another hypothetical this week, and I did read uh, your Merrill memo, and I did read, talk about social media, it's, it's well, stirred up a few issues again, it tends to be the sort of the case these days. <laughs> what was your hypothetical for everybody, and what was the point of the hypothetical this time around? Well, I do, and I do like my columns to be thought-provoking. I don't want to just do boring. I've seen Merrill columns that people have written in various times, other times, other places, and sometimes it's very much a... This week, this happened. Hmm. Well, we've got the po- podcast for that. So, so <laughs> you don't exactly. need a Merrill memo. You won't hear two blokes go, this week, this happened. That's Listen right. to us. <laughs> but I like to talk about things in a slightly bigger picture. Just mm. think about things a little bit differently, pose different issues. And so I do use hypotheticals because I, I did enjoy Jeffrey Robertson and the hypotheticals. It was very clever, that show. It right? was yeah, very yeah. clever. And I like to pose a hypothetical. And I don't know that people always understand what it means. Maybe mm. I've got to just call it something different. I've got to say, this is not a true story. Mm. This mm. Is, bears no resemblance to the truth whatsoever. It's well, just I'll to make you what, think. Though, some of the social media posts, I think, uh, suddenly felt that that was the case, though, with it. <laughs> That's right. They, they were struggling, some people, between established, between hypothetical and truth. That's right. And I did start off. In fact, I think the first sentence in my article said, I am playing another round of hypotheticals this week. What I'm about to propose is fictional. So I, I thought I made it clear, but apparently yes. not. Fiction what, is different to fact, folks. That's right. Now, we've got a problem at council getting enough staff. Mm. As I said, employers across the entire city have a problem getting enough staff. So we're no different to that. So I posed in my hypothetical, mm. we're not considering this. No discussion at all has happened with any councillors. Councillors would be very surprised if you said, hey, I heard you're going to do this. But I posed a solution to this, which was that we take rate pays money, money that we're charged with responsibility of doing the best we possibly can with. And I said that we're going to build a bunch of houses in Dubbo and our staff, 500 plus staff, will be able to live in those houses and we'll give them a 20% rent discount. On that. something very similar to the state government announced, didn't it, mm. in regards to city-based operations? Very similar. Mm. Mm. And I did argue that without adequate staffing levels at council, then our services to the community are hampered. That could be Processing a DA, why aren't you getting the DAs done faster? Well, we haven't got enough staff. Mm. Or why didn't you mow the lawn? Well, we haven't got enough staff. So mm. lots of things that happen in the community are dictated to or driven by our staff. So our staff are pretty important. So I said, this is a bit of a problem. Now, affordability in Dubbo is a problem as well. And remember that we finally got down to 0.1% 
Reserve Bank interest rate in November 2020. Mm-hmm. So that's going back a few years, obviously. It's hard to believe in it. We just sort of stop and think about it. That's, that's right. the way it was, wasn't it? Yeah, that's so right. that was yeah. kind of the early days of the pandemic. Basically almost giving away money. That's what oh, absolutely. That's, that's right. right. Didn't go as far as Japan where it got negative. But, no, that's right. But 0.1%. So that was November 2020. Mm. That stayed at that rate till May 2022. Mm. And then the first increase we'd se- seen since November 2010. Mm. That was the last time we threw an increase. That happened in May 2022. So there's all these people out there that uh, bought their homes that never had to experience the, an interest rate rise. Correct. That's mm. right. Now, so then you go from May 2022, that was the first interest rate rise above 0.1. Yeah. And then by November 2023, so not that much longer, it was 4.35%. So that all has an issue with affordability. So yep. if we say to staff in Dubbo, forget about other areas, don't go and work at another council area somewhere else, will let you have housing at 20% discount over market rent. So that sounds quite fascinating. And then you'd say, well, is it the best place to use our money? Mm. Is there something else you could do to try and solve the housing affordability issue? Why just your council staff? What about other things? Yeah, and so yeah. then I started thinking, well, the council staff that come to work in the morning, they might get a coffee on the way to work. Well, if you didn't have enough baristas, sorry, you can't get coffee in Dubbo because we've got too many people and not enough baristas. Or I'm living in Dubbo now, but I need to get my car fixed or my tyre changed. Sorry, there's no one. There's too many employees or employers out there looking for staff. No one left to change the tyres in your car or no one left to fix your car. The community mm. overall needs, in my opinion, a well-rounded community. A, a, a well-functioning community needs people in lots of different occupations to make it work properly. Isn't that the nature too of hypothetical? Huh. In, it, in the sense that the, what you're talking about there is the whole nature of what why we should be raising hypotheticals. That's right. It is, is to create discussion. You know, what you've talked about there is exactly the sort of discussion that should be being had around the place. And therefore, well, as I say, that there's no silly answer. You know, to put it out there in regards to, what about this option? What about that option? Get people talk, get people discussing. Some people hate ideas and some people love ideas, but <laughs> let's get the ideas out there. That's what hypothetical does. And the idea as well is a thought experiment. Yes. So if someone said, let's go and do that, and then they build houses and they give it to our staff at 20% discount, and we go down the whole path and then we go, oh, that didn't actually work that well. Well, the idea of having a thought experiment, yeah. it's a bit like the difference between, say, a, a theoretical physicist and a practical th- physicist or someone who actually yeah. does experiments. The theoretical physicist thinks about things and goes through a whole thought experiment and says, okay, that's how it should work. And then the practical physicist have to go and do all the work to actually yes. see that it, it does work. Not, by but, the way, Jeff, that didn't really work. That's right. But you want to make sure there's been a th- fair bit of thought put into yes. something before you actually get to the stage where you do it. So I did do all of that because – one of the things that was announced in the state budget was the fact that the state government has announced they're putting $450 million into homes in inner Sydney, four areas, we don't know the areas yet, four areas in Sydney, in inner Sydney, and they're saying approximately 400 employees of the state government will receive approximately a 20% discount on those. Now, these are all a bit unknown at the moment. The only announcement in the budget was a $450 million. The other ones were approximates. But let's just mm. leave it as they are for the moment. So that means 400 employees, 20% discount. Now, there's a lot of government employees in the mm. state, a lot of government employees mm. in Sydney. And then you say, well, who are you going to give them to? So then mm. they said essential workers. Now, essential workers, to me, everyone in society is essential. Mm. We're mm. all essential. As yep. I said, the person who makes a coffee, the accountant who does your tax for you each Absolutely. year. The person who's picking up my garbage on a Thursday afternoon. They're, they're all essential. They're all they? essential to Absolutely. a well-functioning society. Yep. The state government defines essential workers as nurses, police officers, paramedics. Teachers. And teachers. Mm. Yeah, so you, you, you get to be in the, the ball yeah, game there I'm, as well. I always think it's important. <laughs> uh, and I'm assuming when they say teachers, they mean teachers in... Government schools well, and then private oh, schools, yeah, so maybe I'm, you're I'm, out. Maybe I'm falling out of that one, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have no question at all that those four occupations mm. are incredibly important in our society, but I still say the bus driver. We've got a shortage mm. of bus drivers at the moment, we know that. The bus driver that takes the kids to school yeah. for the teacher to do their wonderful work, well, if you didn't have the bus driver, yeah. if you had no buses, well, the teacher goes, we well, don't need me because you've got no one in the class. What about if you're in Sydney, state rail? State rail. You know, there's another classic example. All those yep. people, like, uh, and, and this again, I think, is, is the whole point of the reason why you put the hypothetical forward. Yeah, it is is to okay. Well, we don't have to sit back all the time and just simply accept decisions on things. I think we need to be out there preparing ourselves to have these discussions so that to try to get a, an answer out there that is going to suit more people and going to be beneficial to more people rather than simply small groups of individuals. And I think the important part about all of this is that 
by posing a hypothetical, it got the reaction I expected it would get. In oh, other words, oh, it got a reaction. people said, we don't think you should, in a, in a very polite way, we don't think you should take ratepayers' money and build housing for just your council staff. We don't think that's a good thing to do with our money. We don't think it's fair and reasonable. So mm. my point was proven, I suppose, in that it probably doesn't make sense for the state government to do it. And it gets worse mm. than that in my mind mm. because let's say we, we take it that those four categories of employment – are essential and we can't function inside without those. I mm. agree with that. We can't function mm. without those, but we can't function with lots of others as well. Yeah. But it's worse than that. If I'm a teacher or a paramedic or a nurse or a police officer, did I say police officer twice? No, I didn't. So I got those right. Paramedic, yep. Yep. police officer, teacher, nurse. nurse right. So if I'm one of those four occupations, oh, great. I'm going to get a 20% discount on my rent. Oh, hold on there. Only 400 of those. Mm. There are more than mm. 400 of those employees that yeah. work and live around the city. What makes you so special out of the specials? That's right. So yeah. we've got a bunch of nurses yeah. here and you got picked. So I'm there working beside you. Yes. We're both doing some nursing in a, in a Sydney hospital. And then I say, oh, I've got my one half hour commute home. And you go, mm. huh, I've only got a five minute commute because I've and got plus one of those. 20% off, by the way, as well. That's right. Yeah. A, a short commute and 20% discount. Well, how did you get that? Mm. Well, mm. I don't know. How are they going to pick those winners and losers? That's, yeah. to me, a really big part of that whole question. So mm. it was an interesting hypothetical. I certainly, lots of things in the budget were good. I would have liked to see more folks on regional. Mm. One of the things that's interesting is in the process there, in terms of looking at what they're doing, the, the I suppose, whole program there talked about too much congestion in a, in a Sydney and basically went down that path of saying this is how we can address the problem. I would prefer, and we certainly talk about this with regional cities in New South Wales, mm. I would prefer that they said, we've got regional locations, they can take more people, need yep. to get the housing right for them, but rather than try and put more housing in an overly congested city and take government money to, to build that housing, why don't we get more people to move regional? For example, the Department of Regional, the, the, the New South Wales Government Department of Regional New South Wales, mm has 400 employees that we'd like to see working in regional locations. Yep. They're working in Sydney at the moment. Hmm. Wouldn't that make sense for the Department of Regional New South Wales to be in regional locations? Absolutely. All of them, all it of those employees? It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And probably they're sitting in front of a computer hmm. and using a phone most of the day. Do they actually need to be in the city? And there's probably lots of occupations, and not hmm. just government occupations. Hmm. There are other private employers as well that certainly could justify in a whole range of ways moving people regional. Yeah. So I'll keep writing thought-provoking articles. Mate, I'd love your hypothetical. Keep them coming. Now, you always have a regular meeting with the Dubbo uh, Business Chamber. What is their sentiment from the business community at the moment? Like, how, how are they sort of feeling as though business in Dubbo is going? There are times in the past when I've seen a bit of a two-speed economy, but meeting with the Dubbo Business Chamber, mm. then definitely a two-speed economy. So you've got some businesses that are probably used for various services, maybe essential services, but things that are important to people that seem to be going along either well or even very well. Mm. And there's others that probably you would put in the category of not essential items, but nice items to have, and some of those are suffering. And so mm. one classic is certainly the hospitality industry, mm. where people are saying, I have, I'm struggling with cost of living. And that a lot of that is driven from the research that I've done, a lot of that is driven just by interest rates. So people that borrowed money when interest rates were a certain level, and they could afford it then, and everything was okay, I have people quote to me regularly how much extra per month they're now paying on their home loan than they were mm. a couple of years ago. And they know that number. They know that exact number. It's $375 extra yep. per month. So yep. they know that number. So that's having a real impact on their monthly budget, if you like, their bottom line. Mm. So if I'm doing that and I say my rent, not my rent, my mortgage payment has just gone up by a certain amount, well, one of the things that people say is I'll cut back on coffee or I'll cut back on that lunch. So mm. they don't have to go out and have a coffee. They could make one at home. Mm. But it's nice to have it. So, or they might say, I used to have a coffee every day. I'll just have a coffee two days a week now. I won't have mm. it every single day. So, there are some businesses that are suffering. Having said that, mm. there are still people who are out there looking for more employees, the businesses yeah. are looking for more employees. Yep. But the other one that's interesting is that we're getting much better as a nation paying people fair and reasonable wages. And in fact, Australia is much better than many nations Absolutely, around the world. Yeah. But in some circumstances, there are some employers who have said to the chamber and certainly passed on to me as well mm. that they're getting such good wages that it's harder to get people to work some of that extra. So, for example, mm. 
maybe five or ten years ago, you might have some younger people working. Who wants to work a Sunday? Oh, yeah, I'll mm. my hand up. I'll get time and a half, absolutely. That's right, I'll yeah. take my, my extra whatever yeah. it might be, double time, time and a half, mm. whatever it might be. I'll take that, thanks very much. But now it seems to be, oh, well, I did a Sunday last week, but I need a bit of time because a few friends are doing something today. Mm. And so I, I kind of look back when I was young, there'd be – a few people who would work, I put myself in this category, work very hard and work weekends and you miss out on a few things because yeah. you're trying to get ahead financially. Yeah. Now, either they're getting paid enough money they can survive without doing that mm. or they're treating themselves a bit better. They're saying, no, I'm not going to work. I, I just need a little bit of a break from work and I'm going to just take the day off. I know I could have earned that good money. Mm. So there's that factor in there as well. So there's a mm. few things in there. The Dubbo economy generally is still going along quite strongly. So yeah. we're quite well positioned. And one of the things, one of the, the single greatest attribute we have in our economy is the fact that we've got no single industry driving it. We're not having one industry that dominates it and then suddenly something happens and yeah. that takes the... Because it's interesting, it. people talk about, uh, you know, say, oh, you're from Dubbo, are you? So, so what's, what's the main employer out there? Well, we've got to tell you the main employer uh, straight off, but we're a very diverse group of employment opportunities yeah. out here. And that's, that's right. what you're basically sort of talking about. Hey, tell me, is, is, is the online presence affecting business? Like, if you don't have an online presence... Um, uh, especially within the retail sector. Is, is that is that an issue? I think there's a couple of things associated with that. I think one is that certainly online presence takes away some business from some retailers, depending mm. on what it is. You're probably not ordering a coffee online, although you can, but most people still prefer to get their coffee physically. Mm. But I think you've got to have something. If, even if you do just make coffees and people come in and buy a coffee... You have an online to, ordering option. That's right, thing. that yeah, type yeah. of thing. So I think there is certainly that ability you need to have in your business to have some sort of digital presence in some way, shape or form and, and mm. that's important. But again, as businesses develop and as they continue to develop, then people will work out what they need to do to continue Getting more business. creative in the way they have to sort of, I suppose we're a changing market, aren't we? It's changing market, that's absolutely right. And people move from different areas, so that mm. certainly changes as well. And there's still a bit of enjoyment out of just going out and, and shopping. People still get enjoyment mm. out of that. Yep. One thing that I found fascinating, and this wasn't from the Debo Business Chamber meeting, but it certainly gives you a bit of an insight into some things. I've spoken to a few people lately, and, and typically slightly older people, maybe pensioners, mm. and they've been saying that cost of living is a bit tight and things are a bit expensive. So they're making a choice to go out during the day, not stay at home because it's too cold at home. They don't want to turn the heaters on. Oh. So they're going out to places like shopping malls or even library right? to stay somewhere a bit warmer. So it's a right. bit of an outing for them. Yeah, right. And right in the morning, I'll go down sit around the shopping mall, wherever that might be, yep. and it's nice and warm in there, and I'll catch I up with some friends there. save a few bucks in electricity as well. That's okay. exactly right. Now, I don't know how much you save. I haven't actually mm. done the calculations to see yeah. how much you'd save yeah. by going out during the day rather than staying at home, but I think people are making that choice. Even the library, I think we're finding more people are coming to our library during winter because mm. they want to sit somewhere nice and warm and there's mm. no charge to come to the library, but we do get a lot of people using our library as well. Okay. Now, I saw you uh, standing with some very skinny people and biters in a building site this week. Um, was this the latest uh, check presentation for the Toyota Tour, o Tour de O'Rock at Macquarie Homestay? Is that what this was all about? Because uh, this is the case. Uh, the check, if I remember right, looking at it, was about $235,000. Mm. $1,000. That is so impressive. Slightly more. Your donation took us over the two thirty five, two thirty five four hundred. dollars 235 dollars Oh, that's fabulous. Final. Yeah, that's right. How good is that? $235,000. This is for Macquarie Homestays. This yeah. is to, to help build the, the next little section there too. Yeah, yeah. That And that building site, we were in a building site. We thought that would be a great place to do the check presentation. That's amazing because you guys have now raised over a million dollars, haven't you, for that? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, that's huge. Yep. And this was a little idea that I had talking to Rod Crowfoot back in 2013. Is that right? I said, Rod, I've got a bit of an idea. Let's get together. So I got Andrew McKay because he knew cycling events yep, yep. and Rod Crowfoot and myself and had a chat. And I said, look, I reckon I can involve the mayors in this region. This facility, when it finally gets built, will be really important for the people in the region. So let's see what we can do. And it was a little one-off event, just one-off. Let's go and do 10 people, go for a big bike ride, 1,200 kilometres or not quite, but just under that. And let's do it. And we did it. It's a one-off. And we raised lots of money, about 176000 in that first year. Just a little, uh, side, a little figure, $176,000. Right. And fantastic. And it was only, as Tom went on, people said, you going to do that again? I went, no, no. Look, I was mayor at the time. Yeah. It was a fair bit of work to organize it. And look, nah. And mm. well, look, it was a really good event. So I actually went to my Rotary Club, Rotary Club of Dubbo South, and yeah. said, here's an event I've run. I reckon you could run it better than I could because yeah. you know, you're Rotary, you do things fantastically. So from then, it's been a, a biannual event. So yeah. every two years, 13, 15, 17, 19, 
21 didn't quite happen when it was meant to happen because uh, it was a little COVID, COVID thing. thing that's right. yeah, so it got pushed back to the beginning of 2022. And now this latest one was held at the beginning of 2024. But to their credit, and Ben O'Brien is the chair of that. I've been the chair. There was one year Dave Hayes was the chair. I've been the chair every other year. Mm. And then I just said, look, I'm, I'm too busy with this mayoral role. I really just don't have the time to do it. So Ben O'Brien uh, got a great cycling background. He was yeah. interested in jumping in. So he took over his chair. Retro Club, very supportive again. But what's been fantastic is that's the biggest check in all the events we've run so far. That's the biggest check handed over. Is that over, right? Wow. Which I, I congratulated Ben and said, yeah. Because you've done such a good job, you can stay as chair now, Ben, because <laughs> you've obviously done better than me That's in terms it. of the there fundraising you did. So, well, well done, son. And yeah. by the way, you get to do this again next year. There right. Two years down. So, yeah. and we, we probably will do it next year now. We'll probably go to the point of getting back into the sink. It was always done mm. on the long weekend in October. The Monday of that long weekend was the first day of the ride. Again, mm. it got pushed back with COVID and then this time was a two-year gap, but then we'll probably aim for next year, mm. October, back in getting at the right time frame. It's absolutely fantastic, Matt, because I think I, I love a couple of parts of this. The, the, number one, of course, uh, the money you've raised has gone towards such a, a terrific cause, the Macquarie Homestay there, and you see the benefits of, of what's, how that money has been used. You're seeing the buildings being built up there. You're seeing how people now benefit from the cancer treatment, others who come in there and have to stay in town here from out of town. You give them a place to stay. But secondly, you get to see you know wonderful community people. South Dover Road, like the road groups in Dubbo are fabulous and South Dover Rotary sits right at the top of that that wonderful group of people and and how much money they've raised for same different causes over the years like mm. this Macquarie Homestay with the Tour de Rock and well done again but yeah South Dover Rotary's raised money out there for um, the Royal Flying Doctor Service I know yeah. they've raised a huge amount of money for those guys and that's over, over a million out there as well over, Amazing. over a longer time frame but more than a million dollars little there community well. groups doing their thing you know mm. this, part of the reason we do this podcast is, is to promote Dubbo in such a positive light and all that just sort of to show people hey there's so many cool things happening out there so regularly that we should be so proud of our people uh, for what they're doing and here's a Another classic example of why we should be so proud of, of people like yourself, Matt, what you've done and the group there at South Dubai Rotary and the team there and the other Rotary groups as well and for all the wonderful work that they do on such a regular basis. And all those riders that put their bottoms on the line. And all those riders, line. absolutely, because <laughs> I tell you what, folks, you won't be seeing me on a bike because my backside will not suffer for that. <laughs> and the Mayor of Walgett, I'm not sure if he's talking to me again now because I asked him to join us, as I asked all the mayors to yeah. join us, and he thought he'd just join in for the little... Walgut to Lightning Ridge section, 70 odd kilometres. Just that little ride. Turn up a pair of footy shorts. And <laughs> by uh, the end of that uh, ride, he was complaining a bit. Right there. And I encouraged him to keep going. And the next day, <laughs> he said, I don't think I'm talking to you for a while, Matt, because I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to sit down again properly. <laughs> <laughs> well done, guys. Well done. You have to help me out here, Matt, because I'm not quite sure what SPARC, S P A R C, stands for. But you gave away 10,000. Ten thousand dollars to uh, to a group of people at uh, at Spark the other day. The Spark check presentation ceremony. It's quite a little bit of a mouthful there. So what's all this about? First of all, who is Spark? And you're giving ten thousand dollars to these people. So what's going on there? So Spark is one of our committees in council, right? And I'm not convinced that everyone knows what Spark stands for. Well, I'm one. So we had ten thousand dollars to give away. This is we had two grant funding rounds in, right. in the year. So this is the second one. And I actually did say to the people who had just received or about to receive a check for their Spark money, I said, okay, I'm going to do a little thing here where I'm going to double your money if we can get the acronym worked out what Spark stands for. Yeah, right. I was pretty safe in saying that because oh, I knew no one could work it out. $10,000 bet put on the table. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so it stands for Shaping Plans Around Regional Culture. Oh, see, I would have said community, but culture, there it yeah, is. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. roll off the tongue no, is the problem. No. But It's a nice acronym, though. It is a nice acronym, and that's what it really is trying to do, just promote regional culture. So we've mm. got two rounds of funding, $10,000 each time. To give you an idea of... So this support, this is a double regional council correct. funding. This is not a state right. government fund or anything. No, no, this is a, a council fund. So 20 yeah. grand a year we give away to cultural groups. There's a, a SPARC committee. Councillor Matt Wright is chair of that SPARC committee. Yep. And some people go, SPARC committee, oh, is that like PIN number? Because they think the C might stand for committee, but the C stands mm. for culture. So no, mm. you can say SPARC committee. Yep. And so essentially, there's applications open up. Now, we received applications. If we could fund all the applications we received, $65,000 we were oh, given wow. away. Yeah, right. Okay. So it was pretty competitive yeah. for the five organisations that received money from this process. Yep. And again, I did say that to them in the room, you think yourselves very fortunate, but obviously you had to put good applications mm, in. Mm. There was 
people wanting 65 grand and yeah. you managed to get the 10 grand. So these are community groups that are focused on a cultural element, so Correct. to speak. So okay. I'll, I'll run you through very briefly who they are and what they got. The Debo Film Society got $1,250 to run the Debo Film Festival for this year. You got Kim Goldsmith got $1,000 to produce Lunchtime Listening Lab. You got the National Trust of Australia got one thousand two hundred and fifty to help them with their digitisation of Dundalamore Home Seed Collection. Oh, I was going to say so. There's a local branch of that, is it? Correct. Yep. Okay. And I'll come back to that one in a moment. Yep. Oroscon got two thousand five hundred dollars for the Garba Festival of Dance, and Social Gain received four thousand dollars for Town Telly with Cam and Chaz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Now yep. let me go back to the Dundalamore Homestead. I Typically, with all these grant money we give away, I typically get people to sing for their supper. Not literally, but I do say... Geez, you're a tough man. I, I, give away I am. Money. This does, I am. There, there was a, there's a, a price attached to this. <laughs> <laughs> what I love to hear from these different groups and organisations mm. and people is how they're going to use the money. Because I guarantee the amount of money they get, they're going to double, triple mm. the effectiveness of that money. And so mm. one example was Dundalamore. So $250. So each time I'm about to give away a cheque, I say, please come forward and tell the rest of the people gathered here, pretty safe environment, how are you going to use the money? And I said, I'm sure you're not going to digitise the entire collection of Dundalamore for 1250 mm. And so she came forward and said, that $10,000 is the estimation of what it will cost them to get that whole collection digitised. But by using volunteers and mm. by asking a few people for favours and leaning on a few people yep. and doing yep. what these great community organisations yeah. do. Yeah. We just talked about that. This is what our community does. That's it? right. Yeah. Then 1250 maybe not get them all the way to the finish line, but we'll get a large chunk mm. of the way to the mm. finish line. So, again, that's what they mm. different organisations do. That's how they can be effective. So I do get a bit of a buzz, and it's it's their money I'm giving away. I do say that to them. I'm actually giving you your money back. Mm. It's rate pays money that we use to give to these different organisations, mm. but it is quite nice to see that. And even just looking through some of the other applications, I go, oh, gee, I wouldn't mind funding that one. Oh, that's a really mm. good one. Oh, that looks good there. Ultimately, we have to make a decision. And mm. even one of the people at the event said, it's actually – a pretty tough job just to put an application in. You're putting yourself out there. You know this is going to go to a committee to look at and then it's going to go through a public council meeting for yeah. a public decision to be made by council about that funding. So yeah. oh, it could be a bit embarrassing if you put your name forward or put an organisation forward and then you don't get the mm, money or it's recommended mm. against that. Uh, so it is all of that. It takes time to fill in yeah. all the rest of it. So, so the, tell me, what's, what's Cam and Shaz's thing? What, what are they doing? Well, they got to explain that. So I was going to say, they like, it's, it's, it's the major one of $4,000. Yeah. Something about, what, a television, telly, something? What was that? A little bit like the Cam and Shaz show that used to be on radio. Yes. They're basically taking that same concept and they're turning it into a, a video Concept, so like a YouTube sort of thing, something like that. Okay. Yeah, they'll they'll put that up on various social media channels. They'll put up on YouTube and other channels as well. But yeah. the same as anyone that followed Promoting the Cam and Shay show and uh, what's happening in the region, just that being sort of stuff. positive about what yeah, things yeah. are happening there. Yeah. So it's taking the same concept that was an audio only medium and taking that to a visual and audio nice. medium. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Oh, they're two lovely ladies. I'm looking forward to sort of seeing what their end result. Wellington Senior Citizens, well, they hosted a one of those uh, wonderful Biggest Morning Tea events uh, during the week. Let me guess. Did you recite some poetry for them? I did. I did. By popular request, I must of say. Of course they did. Of course they did. So they're all sitting there going, mm, oh, oh, you all want some poetry, do you? Yes, yes. Okay. I was just waiting for the first person to ask. Well, one thing you could do is you could feed the homeless of the entire LGA out of the food they provide oh, at these events. Don't they just pile it on? And don't you love it, though? I, 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 like I, it's always one of my, my great memories of uh, my grandmother with her cooking, and she'd go along these CWA meetings, and uh, you'd go along there, and there'd be sponge cakes, and there'd just be every type of slice you could ever possibly imagine, of course, and, you know, wonderful stuff. So they, they sound like they turn it on again, did they? They do, and I don't actually eat any of it, which yeah. I feel a bit insulting when I don't. But I've said to them in the past, when I first became mayor... You didn't make mayor, an or something. No, no, did I didn't do that. When I first became mayor 30 years ago, I did what I thought was the right thing in every event. I went to it, you know, I'll have some of this and have a little bit of that. Yes. And I put on a couple of kilos in the first month, and that's I went, well, f- this can't be any good. So I actually just say... kilos put into this. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I've said, no, look, I'm sorry, I, I won't eat it, because I do... Not even, not even a little bit of sponge no, cake? No, it looks so good. With that fresh cream and... But I look you know, at it and Fresh go, strawberries on top. If I have one piece, I'm going to have ten. Like, oh, it looks so good. Yeah. So. <laughs> that's right. But I did do some poetry. I did Little Red Riding Hood and the Wolf by Roald Dahl, which is a very oh, funny little poem. You're breaking out into the Welsh uh, yeah, sort of yeah, style that's there. Right. Why not? Because normally you sort of focus on your Australian poetry. I do, but Roald Dahl, I used to like reading some of his books. He, he has a different way of looking at things, and this poem is exactly that, a different way of looking yes. at things. But the other thing that I did was a bit of Q&A. So I said, okay, what other questions have you got? And there was some good Q&A, you know, 
art- or items raised during that process. Right. So uh, I'll pick on a couple of topics. One of them was dogs. Someone wanted to know about dogs. They've got someone obviously nearby yeah. that they don't like the dogs. And they said, there's a limit. I know there's a limit on the number of dogs. And I said, no. In our LGA, there is no hard limit on the number of dogs or pets you can have. Okay. But your yard's got to support them. So if uh, you've got a 600-metre yeah, yeah. block with a house on there and you've got 20 dogs in the mm. backyard, it's going to be pretty hard for you to justify that they're living in reasonable conditions, not mm. animal cruelty. So essentially there's no number that says this is how many. And of course it would be different for different size dogs as well. Mm. So they've got to be kept in a way that is reasonable and, again, not animal cruelty for those animals. So that was one to address that. Another one was in terms of planning. Some people talk about there, there was a, a carer for an elderly person there that was in a wheelchair. Mm. Some shops in Wellington don't have a ramp, so they said we've got a step to get up there. Can council fix that? Mm. But no, they can't. Mm. Retrospective planning laws don't apply. If that particular shop business was done, the DA was approved, mm. when you didn't need to have ramps in place, which I don't know how many years ago that happened, but... Mm. That still stands. So yeah, right, as long okay. as it's been in use that whole time, you've got yep. existing use rights. So you'll even have sometimes there'll be an organisation that will have a facility in an area that's not the right zoning for that area. You know, how can that possibly be there? Mm-hmm. If it was there before the zoning was changed, you've got existing use rights, which continue on whatever it's being continually used. Yep. But I said, just go and approach that shop and they might see value in putting mm-hmm. a ramp in mm-hmm. Because you've to got people the, the patronage of yeah, the, the exactly people right. sort of walking through the store. Yeah, okay. The other one that came up, and I actually brought this one up, I wanted to hear a bit of their feedback, was going cashless at the tips. Yes. And yes. I thought this was a target audience. It probably. Absolutely. Well, this has been the, the group which, uh, you know, uh, people sort of said, well, what about my grandparents? Who, Correct. Who doesn't, uh, my grandfather, he doesn't carry uh, any of those little uh, cards, and he ever carries cash. Yep. So I, I said, so I, I knew I was poking the, the hornet's nest a little bit. Yes. And I said, so have you heard the announcement? It started back in March that we're going to go cashless at our waste facilities from the 1st of July. Mm. And around the room, it was fairly universal that they didn't like the idea. And right. so I said, okay, I, I want to get some Is more information. because they, they just carry cash and well, prefer those transactions? Or? They do like to carry cash. But I did say, okay, I, I want a couple of questions answered. First of all, mm. put your hand up if you've used the waste facilities, any waste facilities, in the last year. No hands went up. Five years, no hands went up. Ten years, yes, I've got a couple of hands. So across the board in that room, roughly, there were a couple of people who had used it maybe ten years or between five and ten years ago. So the impact it's going to have on you using it, minimal. But then I said, okay, have you got some form of plastic, some form of payment that's not cash? Oh, yes, yes, I've got one. and Mm. Everyone did have one. And I don't like to use it. I'd rather use cash, but I've got it there if I need to. Mm. So, sure, not the best thing from their perspective, but again, they could see the logic when I explained, Mm. especially the bit about banking, taking Wellington, bring it to Dubbo to do the banking of 1% of our transactions that go through there. Mm. So you might have a small amount of money and then you've got to get it across to Dubbo Mm. because the bank that we bank with doesn't have a branch in Mm. Wellington anymore. Maybe we should change banks. That might be a solution, but that's a big job as well. You know, it's interesting uh, in talking through that. It's it's, And I've sort of thought a little bit about this. I think it's it's almost like uh, in America with with when it comes down to uh, even things like gun laws and stuff like that. Don't take away my right. To, to carry a gun or don't take away my right to carry cash in this situation or don't take away my right to use cash. It's, it's Even though most people will never ever use a gun, I also want to have the right to carry it. Yep. And it's almost like the same sort of thing here. I, I may have to worry about using the cash. I've still got my card here, but don't take away my right to use the cash. Mm-hmm. And it, it almost feels a little bit like that in the, the sense that it's a lot of the, the, the anger and the angst that sort of comes forward from this is, as we talked about, 99% of the transactions out of these waste depots have been through the card use. They haven't been through the cash. People aren't using the cash, but there is the angst in society. It's almost like, you know, uh, governments, stop telling me what I can and can't do. Mm. Even though I don't do it, yep. I just don't want to be told that I can't do it. Yeah. And it's interesting in my own personal business, I wouldn't do it. I want to take money from any different way people want to pay me for it. I want mm. to make sure I'm not missing any customer out of that process. But in the circumstances with the transfer facilities and the and the waste facilities, it was such a low number, as I said, 1% it was down to that we're using cash. Mm. And then the extra issues, the extra staff time it takes to transport that money. Yeah. With such a small amount of money, you still got to count the till the beginning of the day, count it at the end of the day, go through that process for sometimes very minimal money taken. And then mm. the the 
I suppose, nail on the coffin with some of the break-ins we've had yeah, where people were looking for cash. Yeah. So I understand why we've gone in this path in terms of the waste facilities, and I support it, absolutely support mm. it in that. I wouldn't support it going across the board in every council facility. Mm. The Old Abbey Jail, you can only come in the Old Abbey Jail using some form of plastic, and I'd say, no, I don't think that's right. I think we need to be able to take cash mm. at the Old Abbey Jail. Because you don't a, have the same problems at the Old Abbey Jail as you had at the waste depot. All of that as well, yeah, but also yeah. it's a it's a retail-facing tourism facility. You want to be able to take mm. that cash just like my business might be in a retail mm. environment. So it's horses for courses mm. in this case. I, I think it's okay. I'd love to have a look in 12 months' time to see if we've actually dropped income by 1% mm. from that or whether mm. it just continued on down the yeah, same path. There's probably too right. many other variables to see whether that's actually had an impact or not. Well, it yeah. certainly sounds like the discussion the settlement in Wellington was a fruitful discussion. Mm. Now, people don't always know what they're in for when they commit to stand for council, do they? And I'm pretty certain that they didn't expect to give blood for the cause. I didn't realise the fact that when you put your name up for that, that's all part of what you do these days. I'm not sure if you're talking about uh, making blood like Loki at Hoden or drinking blood like Megan Fox and MGK. <laughs> but what are councils doing this week that involves blood? We are denoted, donating blood. You're so, donating blood. Yeah, so we did the same thing last year. Well, it's actually really, it's, is this a, a volunteer thing or is it literally we sign up for this, this is what we're going to do now? Well, it's not, it's volunteer. Voluntary for councillors. So yes. basically, it's just helping the Red Cross. They do a three month blood drive right. starting from the 1st of July. So we're doing it this Friday to basically help promote it all. Yep. And it's a bit of a competition because you've got rankings amongst different organisations. So we've got council in there amongst different organisations. So like, like a team almost. That's right. right exactly okay. right. Yeah. And then we've also got our LGA against other LGAs around the state and nice. then essentially across the nation. So it's kind of driving that, but it's really just because to give blood. To give blood yeah. And the Red Cross talks about the fact there is a greater need for blood at this time of year mm. and in fact lower donation levels. So what we're really doing is just helping promote it. So mm. we'll have a couple of councillors down there on Friday giving blood, take a photo, post it and say, if you get the chance, if you haven't done it before or if yeah. you've done it before and you want to go in and do it again, next three months really focus on that. Oh, it's fantastic because it's such a worthy cause and it's, it's you know, I'd, I'd hate to sort of think that there are people out there now that, that need it, but there will be. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be the reality is the fact that people need blood, yeah. whether you're a cancer patient or whether you're just simply in need of the fact for some condition you may have, but as you say, we're always short. They're yeah. always calling out. So well done. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, no, I think it's good and I think it's good just to help. If you can do something like that to help promote it in the community and if yeah. that makes any one person go, oh, I haven't given blood for a while or I've been mean to do that, then that's a good enough excuse to do it. So hopefully it helps Absolutely. with some of that. Well, well done to all the councils involved. Ah, now, lastly, the June council meeting is going to be held this week and it's going to be a big one, I think. Um, now, the, lo the actual location for this has changed to the Double Dubbo Regional Theatre and Convention Centre. I have a feeling I, I know why this has happened, uh, but you might talk to our listeners in regards to why the change. Why the change in location for this? We had the last council meeting where the Debo Regional Livestock Markets wasn't on the agenda, mm. and we had about 100 people come along and attend that meeting. And our current chamber, as it sits, can't really accommodate 100 people mm. easily. Mm. And so people are kind of standing up and around the edges and extra chairs. And so we thought that's a bit tough if you've got to make people squeeze in around like that. We want to make sure we give access to as many people as possible. Yeah. We've talked about it before. Not many people attend the meetings physically anymore. They just watch online. But in that scenario, they wanted to come along, which mm. I love. I, I actually prefer it when there's people in the audience there because it feels like it's more mm. real. It feels like there's the people that we're impacting by our decisions. Every single decision at every single council meeting is impacting people in our community. So people sitting there is great. Mm. So we thought we'd move them across to the theatre. We did it once before. I remember back approximately 2014, there was the Save Our South Mm. agenda or or promotion that was happening when we were talking about making some subtle changes to the zoning around, it wasn't just South Dubbo, but around uh, some of the buildings, some of the, the blocks of land that would be impacting South Dubbo. So a bit of promotion, the radio station jumped on board and we had lots of people wanting to come along to a meeting, so we moved mm. it across to the theatre. So we're doing the same thing this time. So this will be in the tier theatre. Meeting starts at the same time, 5.30pm. Five five yep. The rules will be the same, so I'll, I'll talk to the audience at the beginning and saying, we need everyone to be quiet while we're doing it, even though there might be a, a large number of people. We don't want people cheering or mm. hurrahing or booing or whatever. We just want people to be, remain, I suppose, yeah. uh, keep order in the meeting and which, be respectful. Which has to be done. Yeah. It, it has to be done. Like this, this is a council meeting. Yeah. This, this is not a rally. 
You know, you know what I mean? Like this, this is not the opportunity to sort of sit there and 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 to carry on like a rally. This is yeah. a council meeting. Yeah. I know there's a lot of emotion surrounding. You know, one of the obviously the, one of the main items on the agenda being uh, the the um, the sale yards out there, but it's so important and a, a plea and a call out to everybody involved in regards to going along. Don't go along there thinking the fact this is a rally type situation. Go along there thinking the fact you get the opportunity to have a speak, you speak for whatever your time frame is, you sit down, and then you listen respectfully to the discussion and the conversation. And I will say that it's been mostly like that at this stage. There was one time there was a, a little bit of um, noise, if you like, from from the from the crowd, from the people there. But yeah. I kind of had to be a bit harsh and say that I do have the power to kick them out of the meeting. I don't want to do that because I want yeah. people in there involved and watching and being part of listening to their overall debate and discussion. But I also don't want to have a meeting where you've got it basically getting to that stage where there's discussion happening, things happening, noise, or intimidation, intimidation of councillors depending yeah. on which way they might want to be voting and then yeah. feel like they're being intimidated. So that's an important part of the overall process. Yeah. And again, I said so far, a couple of little minor incidents, but so far it's been very good. So mm. I, I hope it'll be the same way again. But look, I'm looking forward to it. Second oh, good on you. time ever. We're on stage in yeah, the, yeah, in the, right. the well, theatre. You're, so. you're, you're not a sort of bloke that's uh, not, not having been on stage before, mate. You know the lights of the DRTCC. You've been under those a few times for your performances over the years, but this time it's a whole different sort of role. Yeah. So obviously then the sale yards are on the agenda. Uh, it is so this, this is finally, out of all the previous meetings that we've seen people come to, yeah. they haven't been on the agenda. This meeting will make a decision, one of three decisions. Now, it could change because councillors can bring forward different things, but yeah. essentially our business papers, which are available now for people to download and read, will give councillors essentially three options. It'll either be to sell the yeah. sale yards. That'll be one option. Now, remember all the talk we've had, you're going to sell the sale yards, blah, blah. Yeah. And I've talked about it before. No councillor has made a decision. It would be a breach of the code of conduct if they've made a decision. But finally, this yep. Thursday night, will be the time to make a decision. So it could be to sell the sale yards. If it's being sold, that'll go out via a tender process. So it won't be we're going to sell and this organisation has won the tender because it was an EOI process before. Mm. So if we decide to go down that path, then it will be we'll go to tender for the sale. But the decision then and only then mm. will be to sell, but we just won't decide who we would sell it to. Yeah. Or a second option would be that we lease the sale yards. And again, that would be a long-term lease. We'd have to decide exactly that. It might be a 10 plus 10 lease, for example. Mm. Again, it would be a decision to lease. It would not be a decision to go out and say, oh, we've now leased it to company X because their expression of interest was the best. It would be, great, we've got to gauge now the interest out there. Then that would again be a tender process. Mm. All of this could change because, mm. again, I'm talking about things that – may happen in the future, but mm. councillors can change what happens. A council could move a deferment for whatever reason mm. and we resolve that and that all changes it all again. Um, and the third option would be that council retains it internally but changes the operating model, changes the pricing for the operating model and that information is in our business papers as and well. I suppose depending what happens on the first motion, if the other two are relevant. Well, it wouldn't. It, there would be... The way it would work is there are three options in our business papers. Yeah. What someone would do... Are you voting on councils, each one of those as, as no, a motion? No, no. What you would do, the councillors would say, I'm going to move option C, for mm -hmm. example, and then we'd debate that. And I would point out to councillors that if you don't want option C, you want option B or A, mm -hmm. then the way to get that is to vote down this motion and then we'd go back and someone would move on to the other two, for example. Mm, okay. We'll be in trouble if all three are defeated. That's a bit of a problem. Say, that could be an issue then. <laughs> That's yeah, right. Yeah. I'm not sure what we do then, but no, hopefully that won't happen. But yes. essentially you... It sounds like you cover them all pretty well, I think, those three That's right. There. And and it will be up to councils which one they move first and mm. which way that debate goes. It might be they move on first that isn't going to be the preferred option mm. and then from that one, once it's defeated, then another one. Or mm. if the first one is one... If someone said, I want to move the other one, then I'd say, I'm not going to accept that because we've just made a decision on what to do. That other decision, you, you can't suddenly undo that unless you move a rescission motion, which is mm. a very technical process and what you would do. So, mm. sure, now that's on the books. Now, And the moment I say motion carried or motion lost, that's when that decision becomes relevant. Mm. So, not before, but once that decision, once I say those words, then it's then a resolution of council. So if then someone says, oh, no, I actually prefer option A. It's so too late. Too late. Or yeah. if you want option A, then you need to go and do a rescission motion to mm. undo what we just did. Mm. And I'd allow you to do that at the meeting and move that rescission motion, but you can't do it next week or next month. Just a clarifying point there. So can, can each councillor get one opportunity to speak to each motion? So each motion, this is where committees are a bit more flexible than a council meeting. A yep. council meeting, you only have the chance as a councillor to speak once. Yep to a motion in terms of the debate. Mm. 
you, if you move the original motion, you also get a chance to talk at the end. So right, okay. you get the first go and the last go if you move the motion. Yeah. But everyone else only gets the one go. Now, sometimes counsellors will get up and, and go to speak again. And some people that have watched me might have heard me say, have you got a question, Councillor X? Mm. And that's more or less a signal to them to say, you've already been part mm. of the debate. You can't debate anymore. Mm. And so then they can get up and ask a question or they can clarify something, but they can't engage in the debate again. Mm. Now, if if that happened on the first motion, then, and if it was defeated, then the next one, yes, you can do it all again because it's a new motion. Mm. Amendment's the same. If someone moves an amendment, then everyone gets to speak on the amendment as a separate item. Okay. Right, that, okay. That's right. Yep. And then the really tricky part, which many people get wrong chairing a meeting, is if Councillor A moves the initial motion and there's a debate on that, and then Councillor B says, I want an amendment, Councillor B can move the amendment, Everyone has a, another go. That resets, mm. if you like, the, the counter in terms of how many times you've spoken. But Councillor B doesn't get the chance to do a right of reply at the end of the debate about the amendment. The mover of the original motion, Councillor oh, A, so goes all the way back to that. gets the right of reply okay. to the amendment. Yep. Right? Right. And then yep. if that amendment's lost or is, is won, then that becomes either part of the motion or not, and then we're back. Yep. So if, if three people have spoken on that original one, mm. goes the amendment, everyone speaks again, go back to the original mm. motion, those three people have already spoken on that, they don't get to speak again, mm. even though that motion might have changed ever so slightly. Mm. So it's a bit technical, yep. council meetings, so you've got to run them very strictly. And this is the thing with the public forum. There'll be people mm. speaking at public forum. Our code of meeting procedure says five minutes, five zero zero minutes, is the time that people can speak for. And, but there's a length of time, too, that you allocate for, for that, don't you? For the whole hour, thing. For the it's whole 30 minutes. 30, 30 minutes. minutes. So right. literally, if you're one of the – so you spoke for five minutes. Yep. Well, you've used up – what's that? Uh, one-sixth. One-sixth of the time frame. Yeah. Okay. So sometimes I've, I've seen people write on social media, oh, the mayor didn't like what I had to say, so he cut me off. Mm. I've never cut someone off except five minutes. Yep. Yes, I'll say that's Which the end of it. you're entitled to speak to. Or – very rarely, but sometimes mm. I've had people start to make defamatory comments. And I'll say, sorry, stop there. This isn't a forum for mm. you to make defamatory comments about staff or about councillors. Mm. Continue on with your five-minute allocation, but don't make defamatory statements. And that's as much to protect them as anyone else. Yeah, absolutely. But it's not an opportunity for people to come in there and start making mm. slanderous comments about staff because the staff don't have the opportunity to stick up for themselves. They yeah. can't get up and start talking and say, that's wrong, you're saying mm. things about me. Well, you've got two things. You've got the laws of proceedings in regards to how the process needs to be run, and that's yeah. under very strict guidelines. And also then you've got the general rules of society, the laws of society. That's right. You, yeah. know, yeah. you don't want to break into that either. Yeah. I, should I stand up and say, it's not social media, okay? This mm. is this is mm. a normal conversation you're having with someone in a polite way. Yeah. And, of course, respect the, the actual discussion, and don't disrespect the person. Well, I think it's a really important part of this too. It's very rare, and I can't think of any example where I personally can think of that, and, and in general, where someone gets up and starts insulting someone, and they go, yeah, you know, that's one the debate there. And a former counsellor used to say to me, once the personal insults start, mm. have a grin on your face, because mm. you know you've won the debate. Absolutely. If you've got something good to say in the debate, you're not going to waste your time with personal insults. No, no. It's when you run out of points, I've got nothing else to make. Oh, I'll say he's got a funny haircut. Yeah. And then that's it, you've won the debate. That's right, yeah. absolutely. Well, it's a good chance to see Democracy in Action on Thursday night for all those wanting to come along. Now, is it going to be available online? Can we watch Still stream online, online still okay. stream afterwards, that's fine. Just and there's go another, to the, do our TCC or DRC website. Just go to the, the dubbo.nsw.gov.au website. Yep. And there's another minor thing that happens at the meeting as well, which mm. will be deciding on our $180 million budget. Oh, that little thing. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Normally, that would be the focus of the last council meeting at the end of June. Yep. But for some reason, the sale yard seems to be the focus rather than the, the I tell budget. you what, I'm looking forward to next week's chat. <laughs> yes, indeed. So am I. All right, Matt. A lot to get through there today, but we got through it all again, which was great. Uh, time for Limbrick of the Week. What have you got for us this week? Well, it's the highlight, obviously. We talked about it before. The highlight, the most exciting part of... The week and most exciting part of the res since 20th of July 2020. Uh, yes. And I, I gave myself a challenge. I wanted to get our two words that sound very similar in the one limerick in the correct meaning. Right. So it's about yeah. the squadron energy, $3.6 million. Yes. And see how I go. You can give me a mark on how I use the word that you, you know I'm going to use in here, the two separate versions of this word. It's a like. bit like Africa and Toto, you know, that's trying to get in Serengeti. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In Dubbo, a promise now set for a sewage plant we'll soon get. Millions from Squadron's hand to upgrade our sewage plan. 
From the res, this is our best result yet. <laughs> you would have made an English teacher, I'm telling you now. <laughs> <laughs> now well done. I'm, well not, done. I'm not sure. I know you like to give me marks and, and give me gradings. But I always give you three, mate. You know that. <laughs> Thank you. But personally, that's my best one yet. I just because you like the fact you managed to sort of pull those two words. There I together. did. I had yes. to work a bit hard at that to get the two words in there with the correct meaning from both. So Very clever. I'm happy with that one. So I'm giving myself a good mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done. Well, folks, that wraps up again for straight from the mayor's mouth. Until next week, take care. Straight from the mayor's mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.